live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. The 1982 season was definitely a weird one for a variety of reasons. From the strike cutting off two months of the season, to regionally televised playoff games, to some absolutely bizarre situations and stories that I've covered on this channel before, we're not going to see another year like it again. And for good reason. And one of the weird things, and maybe the weirdest quirk of the strike short in 1982 season, dealt with this team right here, the Green Bay Packers. Including the postseason, the Packers played five home games in their home state of Wisconsin. And oddly enough, three of them took place at Milwaukee County Stadium. Because of the games that got canceled, and because of how the schedule worked itself out, the Packers played the majority of their season away from Green Bay. The Packers only played two of their home games at Lambeau Field in Green Bay, where they usually play. The first one of these was a 30-10 drubbing at the hands of the Detroit Lions on December 12th. But the second one, well, we need to talk about the second one. Because for Packer fans in Green Bay, who hadn't had a chance to see their team play at home all season for the most part, they went absolutely nuts for this game against the St. Louis Cardinals in the first round of the playoffs. And it was a disaster. How big of a disaster was it? Lambeau Field got completely destroyed. Security was powerless and helpless to do anything. People got injured and arrested and caused a scene. And the aftermath was so bad that during the offseason, literal laws were put in place in the city to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. This is the story behind what might be the biggest disaster in the long history and storied history of Lambeau Field. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, which was so disastrous that it led to actual legislation getting passed, we need some context to understand what was happening during the game, as well as anything that may have led to this fiasco in the first place. It's January 8th, 1983, and we are in the first round of the NFL playoffs, with a game taking place at Lambeau Field between the Green Bay Packers and the St. Louis Cardinals. Yes, you can put an asterisk next to this one, as nothing about this postseason was normal. It was called the first round instead of the wild card round, with eight teams in each conference getting in. The entire postseason was known as the Super Bowl tournament. This first round of games was regionally televised, and Lambeau Field wasn't even sold out, which is hard to believe for any game, let alone a playoff game. Can you imagine a Packers game getting blacked out? However, the stakes were obvious for both teams. Win, and your season continues, while a loss ends it. And for the Packers, besides the obvious fact that this was a playoff game, historically speaking, this was a big game for the team. After the Vince Lombardi era, this was a team that had fallen on hard times, and this was a fan base yearning to celebrate anything. This abbreviated season was the first time since 1978 that they had a winning record, and just their second time since Lombardi's departure that they even made the playoffs as they last made it in 1972, when they were on the road and lost 16-3 to Washington. This was Green Bay's first time hosting a playoff game since the 1967 season during the Ice Bowl. This was a team and a city that had gone a decade and a half without hosting a playoff game or winning a playoff game. In other words, if they won this game, they were going to go nuts and let 15 years of anger and frustration out of their system. And sure enough, Packer fans were in for a treat, because there was absolutely no stress involved in this playoff game whatsoever. This game was more like a giant celebration than anything else. It might have been the least stressful playoff game in franchise history, because at no point did the Packers ever have to break a sweat. Oddly enough, this is not the first time I've talked about this game on my channel. As a year ago, I did a video on a bizarre coaching decision made by Cardinals head coach Jim Hannafin on the opening drive of the game that really set the tone for the Cardinals in the worst possible way. So if you want to learn more about that, click the card in the upper right corner. But after the Cardinals scored a field goal on their opening drive, when they stupidly decided to kick it on the goal line instead of trying to punch it in with one of the best running backs in football in Otis Anderson, it was all Green Bay from there. After that field goal, the Packers scored 28 consecutive points, taking a 28-3 lead which, as we all know, is an insurmountable lead in the playoffs. By halftime, the Packers were comfortably ahead by three possessions, leading at 28-9. to 
They were up 38 to 9 at the end of the third quarter, were up 41 to 9 at one point midway through the fourth quarter, and ended up winning it 41 to 16, taking it by 25 points. Anytime a playoff game is such a blowout that you put your backup quarterback in the game and you have him throw a pass just because you can, that's when you know you dominated. It was a cold day with a wind chill of 10 degrees, but for the over 54,000 Packer fans in attendance that day, they were more than fine braving the cold for this incredible performance and for the team's first playoff victory in the post-merger era. This game was pure domination from start to finish, and part of why that was the case was because of the play of quarterback Lynn Dickey. As a side note, if you want to learn more about Dickey and his great career with the Packers, where he might be the best quarterback in NFL history to never make a Pro Bowl, click the card in the upper right corner. And you could make the argument that Dickey had the greatest game by any quarterback in playoff history with this first round performance against the Cardinals. Against the St. Louis defense that allowed 170 yards or less in five of their final six regular season games, Dickey sliced and diced the Big Red, going 17 for 23 with 260 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 150.4, not even eight points shy of a perfect passer rating. The offensive line was superb, with Dickey never even getting sacked during the game. The Packers' defense forced four turnovers, causing chaos for Neil Lomax all day long, as he got sacked five times. And the best one-two combination at wide receiver in the NFL, and one of the best one-two combos of all time, John Jefferson and James Lofton, showed why they earned that title, as they combined for 200 yards and three touchdowns, picking on St. Louis's secondary play after play. You really couldn't ask for anything more out of a playoff performance. The goal in the playoffs is to survive and advance, but Green Bay did more than just survive. They destroyed. And naturally, with everything mentioned, Packer fans were really happy about the outcome. This was just their second time seeing their team play at home after a frustrating season from a logistical standpoint on so many levels. This was their first playoff win and first home playoff game in a decade and a half. So understandably, they were going to go a wee bit crazy, especially with the outcome never really in doubt. And what followed was, well, a train wreck. An absolute train wreck. Because even though the Packers players didn't really have their work cut out for them on the Saturday afternoon, everyone else in the organization definitely did. What follows is what might just be, in the over 65 year history of the venue, the biggest disaster in Lambeau Field history. Once the final whistle sounded and the Packers walked away from this game victorious, all hell broke loose. For starters, you had 7,000 fans rushing the field, going for the goalposts, and completely tearing them down. Now, anytime you have 7,000 fans just running around on the field, most of them being drunk and happy, it is going to be a mess, and this was no exception. Not only did the fans tear down the goalpost, but they tore down the entire thing. You might be thinking to yourself that this doesn't seem like a huge deal. We saw fans do this after other playoff games at Lambeau before, including the Ice Bowl. And heck, I made a video earlier this year on the time Jets fans tore down the goalposts from Shea Stadium following their 1981 regular season finale win, coincidentally, against the Packers, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But in the Ice Bowl, and in those other instances with the Packers, they left the base and only got the uprights. Not this time, because this time, the entire goalpost was gone. Everything. As early Chateau, the groundskeeper for Lambeau Field, said on the incident, we've had this happen before, but this is the first time they got the whole post. Usually, they leave the bottom part. And security made the conscious choice to do absolutely nothing, and decided to let the goalpost be torn down. Their logic for this made sense. Number one, even though the Packers had 180 security guards on hand, which was a lot for them, as they usually had 120 for a regular season game, 180 people are not stopping a crowd of 7,000 people. That's a fight you're going to lose every single time, and could get ugly very quickly. Packers security director Al Stevens said on the decision, nothing short of our losing would have saved the goalpost. There comes a time where you have to back off. It was a no-win battle. If you try to keep people back, they start to pile up and cause a treacherous situation. So the two options were either sacrifice the goalpost, or potentially risk a stampede disaster 
and the loss of a human life. Yeah, the security guards made the right call there, even if tearing down the goalpost was incredibly costly, as those can be replaced. But not only would it have cost $7,000 to replace them, but remember this. The Packers played on Saturday. The Dallas Cowboys, the number two seed, played on Sunday. So we had no idea how they would do. If the Cowboys lost their game to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, as unlikely as it was, then the Packers, as the number three seed, would have been hosting a playoff game the very next week, meaning that they would have to find replacements for the goalposts immediately and on short notice, which as we saw with the Jets in 1981, is not exactly an easy thing to do. But look, if tearing down the goalposts, even if it was the entire goalpost and it was incredibly costly, was the only thing that happened, then this would be a giant exaggeration. Alas, it was not because the fans were not exactly in a pleasant mood or the right state of mind when tearing down the goalposts. Fans fought each other for the goalposts, with people being tackled on the field trying to get a piece of history. One of the goalposts was dragged onto Lombardi Avenue, which clogged up traffic badly, as it is already a pain with 50,000 people trying to leave a place at the same time. And now, you've got drunken people with the goalposts blocking it up. Men were throwing bottles on the field, which is not exactly ideal. Fist fights occurred in the fight for the goalpost, with 10 people getting arrested. One fan had to be physically dragged off the field, and the grounds crew wasn't even able to put the tarp on the field until a full hour after the game because the fans refused to leave. And one fan in the madness got hurt and suffered a broken leg. The entire scene was absolutely ugly, and Police Lieutenant Jack Adrianson said on the fan behavior, this is the worst we've seen in some time. Granted, that might not be saying a lot, as this was only your second home game since December 7th, 1981. But you get the idea. You had fans getting hurt, fans throwing bottles, fans holding up traffic, fans destroying the field and ripping the goalposts, even though they might have a home playoff game the next week and badly needed those, fans refusing to leave the field, and fans being tackled and getting into fistfights with each other. Other than that, it was totally fine. When you have 7,000 people storming the field, it's not going to be a pretty sight. And we saw that in this game. And the aftermath from this incident was so ugly that actual legislation was passed during the offseason to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. Because there's a reason that in the 40 years since this game took place, not a single field storming incident has taken place at Lambeau Field. And that has everything to do with this game and what happened. After this game a city ordinance was drawn up that allowed Green Bay to fine people up to $500 for storming the field, and the ordinance seemed to receive universal praise. Harold Compton, a retired policeman for the city, said on the ordinance in its passage, I wanted a severe penalty. We have a limited number of police officers at the games, and this ordinance will strengthen their hand. And Al Stevens, the security director for the Packers, said on this, Anything that would dispel a mob scene or disorderly conduct has our support. From what I've seen of the ordinance, I'd fully support it. Just like that, the days of fans storming the field at the frozen tundra were over. And even though the Packers would lose the following week in the playoffs, ending their run as one of the final eight teams left, because they played the Dallas Cowboys, who were the number two seed, that game was at Texas Stadium. So Lambeau Field didn't have to scramble to find a goalpost in time for the game. Silver linings, I suppose. Everything about what happened after the game was a recipe for disaster when you consider the circumstances. And to be honest, it's kind of surprising that it wasn't worse. Yes, this was a horrible disaster, but the fact that the absolute worst that came of it was fist fighting, a broken leg, arrests, a ton of congestion with traffic, and damage to goalposts is somewhat of a minor miracle, because this easily could have been a lot worse and a lot more tragic. The Packers dodged a bullet here, even though they suffer pretty badly. Either way, we're never going to be seeing anything like this take place at Lambeau Field again. And for good reason. Because on this cold January day in 1983, for Packer fans who hadn't attended games at Lambeau all season, they let out all of their built-up frustration in a rather interesting, rather costly, and in some cases, rather violent way. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. 
And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.